means to always think about the future and longevity. Exercising is very important because it helps keep the body healthy and it can actually prevent diseases such as diabetes and chronic kidney disease. The bones do lose bone density as we age and over the years that can add up. If a person is beginning to decline physically, they're often beginning to decline mentally as well. We may wish to be really quick and to remember everything that crosses our field of vision, but hardly anybody is able to do it 50. How come? Baby boomers have a reputation as the first generation engaged in active denial of their aging process. According to a recent article in Newsweek, boomers believe they'll die before they ever become old, and they project a lifespan of close to 100. Such optimism needs to be supported by substantial changes in lifestyle and attitude. Aging well, emotionally, physically, and mentally, is becoming personally meaningful to this group hovering at the brink of 60, convinced they will stay forever young. Hello, I'm Ron Reagan. Like many of you, I've experienced the aging process through parents, grandparents, other family members. If we're lucky, we'll all get to experience this process directly. But whether 36 or 86, the art of aging as a sociological, physical phenomenon can be influenced by groundbreaking research with profound implications. It's been said that in about 20 years, nearly 20% of our population is going to be over 65. That's a large block of folks and that would be the baby boomer bulge, if you will. So what we're seeing is large numbers of people living to unheard of old age, and because of that, we've been able to study that process in the last 20, 30 years in ways that it was never studied in the past, and it's also more relevant because there's so many more people. But what we haven't done is figured out a way to build our lifestyles and build our society around a more active approach to aging. And so the sort of active approach which realizes the mind and the body are connected and both can benefit from that sort of active lifestyle is today's big message. And it's a new message because we didn't know this a few years ago. What are the keys to successful aging? How does this new generation of senior citizens prepare for their next decades? First, a large proportion of this burgeoning demographic may need some reality checks. They must clearly evaluate their current state of health and face what they might expect if they don't make some significant changes in their diet and daily habits. The most recent surveys are showing that we're getting about half of the calcium that we should. And the average American is certainly not getting enough exercise. Too many of us sit around and don't even get up and walk to the store or walk around the block. Lack of exercise is often accompanied by poor eating habits. Fast foods loaded in calories lacking in nutritive value have often been the mainstay of a generation that now needs to understand the components of a well-balanced diet. So a diet that has like um, several servings of fruits and vegetables and a diet that has certain grains and a diet that's probably less than 30 percent fat total. The United States is going through this obesity epidemic and it's probably within the last 10 years we've been much more conscious of it as a nation and it's starting in younger ages so as we age we tend not to exercise as much as we used to and so it's this onset of obesity that probably predisposes people to developing diabetes and hypertension and other diseases that just get worse as time progresses and if people can lose weight they can actually sort of prevent things such as diabetes and hypertension. When you're about 85, half of the women have osteoporosis and half of them don't. In men, that curve starts to go up about 10 years later. So that means if we're looking at men between 80 and 90, 
we have the same rate of fractures as women between 70 and 80. When your bone is in balance, you fill it up as much as you dissolve away. But when you're not in balance, you can dissolve the bone and then not fill it up quite so much, and so you lose a little bit. And over the years, we lose one or two percent, and that can add up to almost 50 percent of your bone by the time you're really quite elderly. The bones do lose bone density as we age, even when you're trying to do all the things to prevent osteoporosis. Tuck one knee to the inside and behind the supporting knee and raise the foot up for hamstring curls. Osteoporosis is a disease where your bones are thin and so they're more likely to break. And you don't know any problems unless you get a fracture and then the fracture is very painful. A lot of people forget that the bone is really very active. And even doctors, they think of it as just being a structure, like the leg on a table. But the bone is always remodeling itself and filling in the cracks, making new bone. So it's very alive and active. And if we didn't have that, then our bones would eventually get a lot of little cracks and just crumble. Clearly, awareness of the likelihood of a reduction in bone density should be on the radar of an aging population. Prevention and strengthening are part of that reality check. The kind of exercise that is the strongest for the bone is what we call impact. We also call it weight bearing. And that's because you can have a sudden shift in the fluid inside your bones and the cells can detect that as a necessary reason to make new bone. The bones feel the impact, your body, um, from your, the top of your spine all the way down to your ankles. So the impact itself is what encourages bone growth and bone health. The building of the bone with the weight-bearing exercise really does allow your body to continue growing bone and muscle to overcome what you're losing. Remember, when a bone is stressed through physical activity and muscle movement, it becomes stronger. Weight-bearing exercises are key to good bone health. Walking, running, tennis, and dance aerobics qualify in that category. Cycling, swimming, and kayaking are good for your overall health, but aren't weight-bearing. nice day to walk. As adults, exercise where you're walking is sensed by your bone cells, and they will make your bones stronger. So that's probably the most important thing that we can all do. And the other important thing is um, a good diet, and that means enough calcium and also enough protein, and enough calories that we're not really thin. So all together, you need to have about 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day. That would be the same as four glasses of milk. Did you do it? Can I do it? Yes, I can. One needs to always think about the future and longevity. And what I've learned over the years is that the stepping stones to good health for a long time, and even when I'm done dancing, is through the nutrition and through the way I eat and how I eat. So for my bones and my muscles, I really try to eat a lot of calcium. And it's perfectly fine to take supplements. Once it's in your stomach, your body doesn't care whether it came from a glass of milk or a calcium supplement. Yogurt is a very good source because a lot of older people have lactose deficiency. And if they drink milk or eat cheese, they have intestinal gas and bloating. But yogurt does not have any lactose because the bacteria have eaten it up. And so people can eat yogurt when they can't drink milk. What would you guess is the optimal amount of calcium an average person needs each day? 1,200 milligrams. Good sources are cheese, yogurt, viactive chews, and some dark green leafy vegetables. Ice cream and lattes are favorite choices, but watch the fat content. Even sardines are great for calcium, but you have to eat the bones. Five. Six. Good nutrition is a starting point for healthy aging and stronger bones, but it has to be paired with smart and effective exercise. Again. Exercising is very important because it helps keep the body healthy and it can actually prevent diseases such as diabetes and chronic kidney disease. 
One of the things that we find in our studies of exercise is there's a huge dropout rate and about half of the people don't even keep their exercise up for one year. So to me the most important thing of an exercise is do one that you'll do forever. Whether that's walking, dancing, hiking, something you can always do for years and years. Walking is, is healthful to your legs and I got rheumatism and arthritis combined and it, it, when I walk it helps, it goes away. And, and I just sort of go to outsmart a whole pile of people and live as long as I can, so I'm going to walk. <laughs> what we know now is that it's very likely that habitual exercise also slows the rate of decline in age-related memory loss, for example, and slows the rate at which people might lapse into a disease like Alzheimer's disease. Now just deep breathing exercise, just breathe in. Just a modest amount of exercise in old age, three times per week, 15 minutes at least, seems to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 30 to 40 percent, which is quite substantial. And if you think about that for a minute, uh, this disease happens late in life, so if you reduce the rate for five or six years, the chances are very good that the person may not be around to get the disease eventually. Exercise has been proven to have many benefits, some in surprising areas like maintaining mental sharpness. The primary benefits of exercise are in prevention of heart disease, some forms of cancer, non-insulin dependent diabetes, obesity, weakened immune system, and regular exercise can also contribute to a sense of well-being. Exercising, no matter what form it is, whether it be Tai Chi or whether it be other forms of exercise, is good for a person, as long as they do it on a regular basis. For myself, I think a lot of activities, different activities, running, swimming, walking, and to remember that the stepping stones to good health is through your nutrition first. Five. Six. Good. Feeling better. Seven. Well, I started after I retired from work, and that has been very exciting to be with a group of people and energizing to row. It took me years to feel like I learned how. Nice loose shoulders. But it's always been good exercise, and I like it because it uses all the muscles in my body. Well, I think the main thing is to make it a habit, just like brushing your teeth. I don't ask myself whether I want to or not. I mean, it's just just part of my lifestyle. I come to aerobics three days a week, and I believe in exercise, and I do volunteer work here, which keeps me in touch with people and activities. One, two. Research also points to the role of exercise in relieving stress and depression. Your starting position, five. Depression is common among the aging population. 17% of those 65 and over have been diagnosed with depression. Often, depression is paired with other medical issues like cardiovascular disease, stroke, or cancer. And it's important to note that depression in older adults is widely untreated and unrecognized. With one quarter of all suicides committed by the elderly, depression is a serious issue and one that needs to be addressed when creating strategies for healthy aging. Exercise is a great stress reliever. When we exercise, we're doing that and we're releasing all these stress hormones and neurotransmitters, if you will, and essentially reducing that anxiety and stress level, which eventually can lead people to more serious depression. And patients who are less depressed basically can take care of their other medical problems. So depression is very important in terms of chronic diseases and probably as uh, sort of medical doctors we don't think about depression like we should um, and that probably contributes to why patients may not be controlling their diabetes or their high blood pressure or, or other chronic diseases like they, they should. Diet and exercise are powerful players in healthy aging. Another concern for those entering the latter stages of the aging process is their mental acuity. Many baby boomers worry about memory loss and brain function now and in the future. If a person is beginning to decline uh, physically, they're often beginning to decline mentally or in terms of their thinking function as well. And if you're starting to decline in your 
thinking and cognitive function, you're probably very likely at risk, if not already declining in your muscle and physical function. And the reason that's important is because as we've learned more about aging, we realize that none of these changes are inevitable. There are cognitive styles that are appropriate for earlier life and those that are more appropriate for midlife and those that are appropriate for late life. So by midlife, we need different kinds of cognitive skills. We may wish to be really quick and to remember everything that crosses our field of vision, which some people are able to do when they're young, but hardly anybody is able to do at 50. How come? What's happening? Is this a disease or is this just the way we're constituted? I think it's the way we're constituted. Our goal as we transition through midlife and into older age is to let go of some of the speediness of our thought processes, maybe even some of the detail, in order to make way for big picture to develop, for people to develop wisdom and a sense of perspective and depth about their life experience. And what we're discovering now is that the brain is far more plastic in that is it can mold itself or it can create new connections based on use, based on habitual use. So for example, we know that uh, a violinist, the finger hand of a violinist is represented by a part of the brain. And if you look at the connections that represent the finger hand in that violinist brain, they're vast. They're just hugely more developed than they would be in the average person. Mental stimulation improves brain function and actually protects against cognitive decline, as does physical exercise. One recent study shows that the more a person exercises, the more their brain is protected. It's vital that an exercise program for the brain gets just as much attention as one for the body. Suggested strategies include crossword puzzles, learning a foreign language, Scrabble, or trying a new hobby. The key factor? Stimulating the brain. Cognitive activity, brain teasers, if you will, games, dancing, card games, telling jokes, laughing heartily. There are many kinds of activities that get the energy flowing. My grandmother is 89. <laughs> she plays mahjong daily. And, uh, you know, for someone who's 89, you think I would have a chance at uh, taking her on, but she wins every time. <laughs> Definitely, I think that uh, Mahjong has helped her maintain her memory uh, at, at the age that she is. People who like doing crosswords find that they're very helpful in keeping them mentally agile. People who don't like crosswords aren't going to find much benefit in doing them. It's going to feel a whole lot like work. For that person, perhaps they ought to be rowing. Perhaps they should be at the gym. Perhaps they should be listening to music. Perhaps they should be taking up an instrument if they love music. So part of what should guide our cognitive activation plans, if you will, and cognitive preservation plans as we age are those very things that we love to do. Exercise impacts bone strength, keeps the brain sharp, and can help counteract depression. But as we age, we need other kinds of daily workouts. Once we've implemented a program addressing our physical well-being, we also need to nurture the social and emotional aspects of our lives. If people are home by themselves and not interacting with their community or with their friends, then they may be at home and depressed and, and they may slide downhill. They may do more self-destructive activities like they may over overeat if they have diabetes or they may not eat the, the right foods that they know they should be eating or they may not exercise it as much. So for each person, no matter what the chronic disease is, socialization and sort of interacting with the community probably helps keep them on the track of being healthy. <laughs> Laughing is one of those things that's a brain tonic. It kind of is like exercise, except that it's more fun. <laughs> <laughs> and it is infectious. It stimulates the same kinds of parts of the brain that music and dance tap into and that emotional stimulation in general taps into. It spreads a kind of positive emotional brain wave, if you will, that is very valuable for cognitive and emotional function. To say nothing of social bonding. I don't know, I get as much out of the laughing as yeah. I get out of the exercise almost. It feels, feels good to Everybody. laugh. 
The old adage, laughter is the best medicine, turns out to be true. If not the best, humor and laughter are key ingredients to wellness. Laughter reduces stress, protects the heart, and boosts the immune system. Chuckling with friends can actually lower your blood pressure and improve functioning of your brain. The value of social interaction and exercise is being modeled by seniors who've come to appreciate the importance of staying mentally and physically active. My name is Murray Stateman, and I'm 82 years old. I want to do exercise and be active. Just, this is active. I think the important thing is to keep your mind healthy. Yeah. Keep your mind going. Learn as much as you can. Be active. Eat healthy. And enjoy your family. Enjoy your friends. And laughter is the best medicine. <laughs> I've always been active. I like exercising because you feel so much better after you've exercised. Stay alive. If you are with other people, you will exercise more. And it's always more fun to exercise with a group. When I first retired, I walked a great deal as part of my activities at the time. And that kept me physically active, but physical activity wasn't the only thing that uh, I look for. I look for intellectual activity as well. And so uh, the intellectual life allowed me to uh, anticipate, allowed me to think, allowed me to participate. Our seniors value their independence and doing exercise regularly allows them to maintain their independence for as long as possible. They know the benefits of exercising, so that motivates them to want to take part. And this going down is yeah. also 14. Plus we try and create programs that are culturally appropriate, so therefore we have the games like Mahjong, the Chinese chess, Tai Chi, Qi Gong, and Bagua Zhang. And the funky chicken, that's right. <laughs> Exercise and other contributors to good health are at the core of optimal aging, but aging itself is a complicated process. There are emotional components as well. One, two. A poignant part of growing older is the increasing awareness of not only our mortality, but the reality of who we've become. Wave hands like clouds. Part of what's daunting for many people about getting older is the fear that the changes that they're going through physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually may result in their feeling embarrassed or humiliated. And as you get older, you know, it gets a little frustrating. You lose your energy and you want to do more things than your body wants to do. There is a dissonance with this image of ourselves as we were when we were young. We look at ourselves and we say, who's that? There is this mismatch between how we feel ourselves to be inside and the person looking back at us. <laughs> For many, this physical progression can be the opportunity to find a measure of peace that may have been elusive in former decades. Part of the key to aging well is adapting to change. You have to motivate yourself. People tell you to do it, and people tell you it's good, and all that. That doesn't help as much as when you say, I feel better, and that's mentally and physically. Together with the pressure to resolve old kinds of relationship conflicts is a greater desire to shift the balance from struggle and trouble to positivity, reconciliation, peacemaking, and joy-making. Grab the chi from the earth and bring it down. There you go. Very good, everybody. Thank you very much. Just like one of my eldest people that have lived here, he was 99 years old. You know, his one key of advice um, that just stuck with my heart is, you know, you just never stop loving. The art of aging well includes a bounty of sound and proven practices, but attitude about the process itself is important. It's a good idea to approach exercise, proper diet, mental challenges, and emotional connections with enthusiasm. That's a crucial step in helping you to feel your best. When I came here, I had to have my cane to walk across the hall. I can walk now and walk at the house without it. There's so much possibility for persons to influence their lives through 
taking an activist approach to aging. And I think baby boomers are the activist generation. And if we can mobilize that, individuals will benefit greatly. And, and as a society, we'll have a healthier, more robust society. Thanks for watching. I'm Ron Reagan, and this has been The Art of Aging. Funding for The Art of Aging was provided by the Development Fund of Group Health Center for Health Studies, a non-proprietary public interest research center devoted to transforming health care in the real world, and by University of Washington Health Sciences Administration. For more information or to purchase a copy of this program, visit www.artofaging.org.